Hey guys, what is up today? This is Dal Su with Dal Su Plays, and I have for you today something very special. I've been playing Banish for quite some time now with the Colonial Charter mod, New Frontier uh, patch, and I thought today I would share with you what I've learned throughout all these playthroughs, my top 10 tips for Colonial Charter mod. My first tip is to always be housing. What does that mean? Well, it means you don't want to ever stop and go three or four years without building some housing. You constantly want to be laying it down. Why? Well, if you don't build housing and you hit one of these death spirals where everyone starts dying, you won't be able to do anything. So you have to foresee the future and be able to say, well, I'm going to need so, so and so many laborers in the future to be able to even farm to feed my people. So even if it seems like not a good time, you want to at least put down three or four houses a year, no matter what. Tip number two, laborers are your backbone. Laborers are the most important job in your whole economy. Why? Do they just chop down trees and mine the stones from the forest? That is the least of what they do in actuality. They are the logistic support for your whole village. They bring things where they need to go and take things where they need to go. If you have a building queued up like this, you can see, before it ever gets the first hammer fall or the first saw from a builder, it's got to have the trees removed by laborers, the logs brought, the stones, the furnishing. All of this is done by laborers. Now, they come on a first-come, first-served basis, so that means if I have a huge section of forest queued up over here to be chopped, they will not bring these materials until all of this has been done. Now, that means if you only have 10 or 20 laborers, you are not going to have this house built for maybe a decade, so keep that in mind. Furthermore, laborers are bringing things and carrying them at all times. You see this farm? You see this pickup? It says farmers take harvest to storage default or disabled laborers take harvest to storage. That is a very, very important button. This field I built much too large and what was happening is the farmers could not harvest it all and bring it to the barn before the frost killed some of the pumpkins. So by clicking this button I allowed my laborers, of which I have very many, to bring the food to the barn for the farmers. This also works on other job sites like the miner or the stone quarry. What happens is the miners will take their iron or their stone and they'll put it outside, you can see some here, of the building. And if there are enough laborers who are not currently busy to do the job, the laborers will then come and take the stone and take the iron and put it in the stockpile. If not, the miners have to stop mining and carry it all the way there, which makes the buildings terribly inefficient. So to conclude this tip, you always want to keep a healthy supply of laborers. You see I have 231, which is definitely overkill, but do not underestimate the importance of laborers for having a highly efficient village. You want to have at least 20 or 30 in the early game, if at all possible, maybe 50 or 60 in the mid game, all the way up to possibly 90 in the late game. That's just my opinion. Uh, you can figure out how it works best for you, but do not neglect to hire plenty of labor. Tip number three, learn your symbols. I'm going to go ahead and walk you through how to upgrade a country house all the way because it's very confusing sometimes about what you need, the production chains, and I'm going to explain the difference between building materials and furnishings and uh, furniture and joists and all the different things that you need because it's quite overwhelming at first. So I'm going to go ahead and lay down this house and then I'll let it upgrade. Obviously you know about log and stone. But do you know about glass? Here's the building you need for glass. It's called a shore house. All it is is resource production, shore house. Make sure that if you're wanting to do glass, you put it onto dig sand. Then you simply build a glass works, which is next door to my brickworks here. And you use furnace fuel and the sand to make glass. Furnace fuel, of course, comes from the fuel refinery, which uses coal to make a more industrial fuel. Here is our basic country house, which we've just built, and we're going to transform it into a nice country house. Here we have a nice country house under construction, and you can see we also need brick now. No more logs. We still need a bit of glass, but bricks. How do we build bricks? Well, it's very simple. You also need a shore house, except you need this one to be digging clay. Once you have that set up, you just build a brickworks, which is here and looks like this and it uses furnace fuel plus the clay to make bricks just like your glass works makes furnace fuel plus sand. 
As you can see, we've got our nice country house done, so we're going to upgrade to a fancy country house. And if you don't know what the symbols are, this is when you might get a little bit confused. Keep in mind that you can check out the symbols by coming to Tools and Reports plus Colonial Charter Icon Mod, and then you can match it. But it's not a very easy way to do it. For example, I'm always getting confused about building supplies and furnishings. They look very similar. One's a box that stands upright. One's a box that lays flat on its stomach. I'm going to talk about those here in a minute as we build the nice country house. Now that we've got our fancy country house ready to go, we can see we need building supplies and furnishings. Don't freak out. I know it's very complicated, but it's not as hard as it seems. What you need is a building suppliers, which you can find in the smithing and crafting and building suppliers. There it is right there. He can actually do furnishings and building supplies. Furnishings are quite complicated to make. You need furniture, which you can get from a joiner right here. You do have to make the joiner. All it takes is a log, but he can do it. Uh, you need rugs, which come from your tailor or clothier as it's called when it's upgraded. Glassware you can make directly at your glass maker. And pottery requires a special building called a putter. Okay, so once you have all those things, you can make your furnishings. Building supplies are pretty simple as well. It's just brick and glass, which I already showed you, plus lumber, which comes from a sawmill. I believe that's right here in the menu. So you can switch this to lumber and he'll do lumber for you. And then you will have all the ingredients you need to make the upper echelons of housing, which also provides your citizens with that warmth and comfort and happiness that they need to give you high ratings on the stars and hearts. And there you have it guys, the fancy country house in all her glory. High warmth, high comfort, everything that your people need to be happy and healthy uh, is available inside. Now this does take a long time. You have to go through quite a few upgrades and they have to tear it down, empty it out, rebuild it. If you want to skip ahead of that, if you're already quite advanced in your production, you can just do an uh, officer townhouse. It seems to be kind of similar in terms of warmth and comfort. However, if you're starting from scratch and you want to be able to upgrade all your buildings as you get into new areas of production and stuff and kind of upgrade your production lines, the fancy country house is where it's at. You can go all the way from just a very simple house to a much, much better, nicer house with the little plants in the windows. Nice little touch there on the model. Um, just make sure that you've got your furnishings, your building supplies. You're going to need plenty of brick and plenty of glass and all that to do this. It, uh, it does take a while to get all those things set up, but once you do, you have the best housing in the game. Tip number four, the town hall is money. I spent a long time before I actually built one and one of the commenters on my video kept telling me build a town hall, build a town hall, and I finally did and I was, holy shit, it makes a huge, huge difference in the game. You see the overview of your whole town, you get like percentage of clothed individuals, percentage of educated individuals, all this kind of information. Production tells you absolutely how much you're using every year how much you're producing every year. So you can see I'm not actually producing enough logs in this town. I'm using a little bit too much. I need to uh, get on that. Okay, so you can see how things work. Inventory just gives you a full list of how much of everything you have. Clicking around to your different magazines and barns is a horrible way to try to figure out you know, how many building supplies you have. So make sure that you come here and look at your inventory. You can see I have just tons of candles sitting in storage and, and that's valuable information. Uh, grass are also useful. I usually use it for food. You can see I kind of hit my peak here and now I'm kind of uh, not doing so great. You can also see things like population, iron, firewood, all kind of different things like that in chart form, which is always very lovely. Next, you can accept or deny nomads, which are big groups of people that come into your town, which I don't usually accept because, you know, I'm not like a refugee camp over here. And trade items at last, you can see what, what you've bought. So like say a merchant comes up and he's got sheep for sale and you're like, wait, did I buy sheep or did I not buy sheep? I don't even remember. Well, you just come to your town hall and you can see that sheep is um, illuminated. That means you've bought them in the past. This is by far the most useful building in the game. You can also go to tools and just click instantly to, to see the information. I like to keep it pinned sometimes so I can see it. Um, it's, it's a very, very useful building. I highly recommend it. Tip number five, know your crop size. Had a lot of people getting on to me for building big ass crops like this. And I have to say they were right, this is a mistake. It's too big, it's trying to use 14 workers and they never get all the damn pumpkins before the frost comes and freezes them. And nobody likes frosty pumpkins for dinner. So instead, what you wanna do is you wanna build farms that are a lot smaller. Uh, you might build a, a bunch in a row and make a similar sized field but it'd be broken up instead. 
This is an 11 by 11, which tends to be agreed upon as one of the ideal crop sizes. It uses three workers by default, and it produces 120 squares of food. That's how big this area is. So this is a good size because the, the workers can get all the food away long before the winter comes in. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of manpower to do, and it just, it just works more efficiently for whatever reason. Uh, the game seems to respond better to smaller crop sizes and make them a lot more efficient. You can see if you go under 11 by 11, this is uh, 10 by 10, you, you can get down to two workers. But also on eight by or nine by nine and eight by eight, you also have two workers. You can adjust this if you want. People say that you can actually do it with less. Uh, I like to usually go with the defaults. So uh, uh, eleven by eleven, having three people is fine by me. It seems to work really well. So when you're doing crops, I know it's very tempting to just. I mean, I, I fell for it. Make a huge crop so that you can get all the pumpkins. But it works much better if instead of doing one huge crop, you break it up into four smaller crops. They'll, uh, they'll be able to just produce more food in the long run. So make sure you know your crop sizes. Tip number six, get the most out of your trade posts. What you wanna do is make sure that you're trading away things that you don't use. Specifically, I like to do it for seeds and uh, crops and those kind of things. Uh, a lot of people like to trade for straight food or straight items. I prefer to be a little self-sufficient when it comes to all that and have homegrown stuff. But I do like to buy a lot of seeds and a lot of crops. Now, another important reason that you do this is not just so that you get new things. It's so that you don't have stuff clogging up all of your storage. If I go to my town hall and look around a little bit, I might see some things that are a little bit shocking and disappointing. I have 10,000 cloth. Am I ever going to use 10,000 cloth? Almost certainly not. I have 8,900 bone meal that's just sitting there. This stuff is filling up all my barns and it's keeping food out that could be in the barns. See, this is 100% full and it's mostly because of cloth and bone meal. This is a mistake on my part. I should have been filling up all of my traders with this stuff so that I could trade it away for something. And I, you can see, I try to start doing that as soon as I can. Firewood tends to trade for a bit more, but uh, later in the game you may have problems with firewood once you start to get into high populations. I like flax particularly because it uh, I always have too much of it no matter what, even though I only have one field. I think it's up here somewhere. Yeah, there it is. I always have too much of it. It's always clogging up the pipes, so I get rid of it. I trade it off for useful things. Now, if you are like me and you mostly like to deal in seeds and uh, new livestock and stuff like that, what you want is the farm supplier. I tend to build two or three of these and they're always coming with new crops, new things to help you out. Um, trading posts, I'm not so crazy about because it's kind of the vanilla and you don't tend to get seeds and stuff so, so fast as you do with the uh, farm supplier. This specializes in seeds and stuff like that. Honestly, I don't really use any of the other trade buildings that much in Colonial Charter, but you can and they are very interesting to be sure. But mostly just make sure you have three or four farm suppliers and that you're moving all of your useless goods into them as much as you can so that they're out of your way and also so that you can turn them into things that are more valuable like new seeds. Tip number seven, the power flatten tool. One of my favorite things about Colonial Charter is this little puppy right here, flatten power tool. Now, it's a little bit cheap and a little bit gamey and a little bit unfair for you to be able to do this, but basically... You can turn anything you want into just straight up flatness. Boom, now you can build crops here. Now you can do all kinds of things here. Uh, for a slightly gentler touch, you can just use this one. This will, uh, this will flatten things, but it won't uh, destroy just everything like that. It'll be a little harder to use because you gotta get it just, you gotta get it just right. It won't always work. So I prefer just to, if I'm gonna flatten something, to just flatten it and use the flat, flatten tool. And this is used to open up new areas for building new areas for crops. It can also be used to build little peninsulas like this. I built this little peninsula out here for my fishing guys. And you can see, I'll just demonstrate real quick. If I wanted to do more, I just do like this. Connect it here. Okay, you can't click on the same thing twice. Like if I want to flatten here, it'll say, nope, can't do that. Can't touch it to this. It has to be on its own, independent of that. If you want to get rid of the little marks, click on remove structure and remove it. And there you have it, a new piece of land for new fishers or whatever it is that you want. Uh, again, this is a little bit cheap, but it is an incredibly powerful tool that really, really helps you go a lot farther in the game. You have to be a little careful because sometimes you'll kind of do flatten here, flatten here, and you'll end up with a little bit of ridge. Sometimes there'll be weird bugs, like see how this tree is floating in the air here? That happens because I power flattened this. 
and weird things like that. But for the most part, it's just such a powerful tool that I really recommend it for those of you who are struggling to get more space on your map. So make sure you make good and responsible use of it. With great power comes great responsibility, of course. Tip number eight, market power. So markets are very interesting buildings that are really, really useful in Colonial Charter. Uh, what you have here is a building that will go out and collect resources from all over the map and bring them to a central hub. You have small market, rural market, and central market. They just collect everything. And then you have specialized things. This is a protein stall. He'll go out and get meat from different places. And uh, the people inside this circle will be able to go to him anytime they want and pick up some nice protein. Okay, so a market allows you to build suburbs outside of your main hub. You can see here's my main area where most of my hardcore production goes on, where a lot of my resource mining goes on, where a lot of different things go on. But I wanted to go out and build some suburbs in different areas. So what I did is, is I popped down a large market right in the middle of all where all my housing is going to be. And then I built housing inside that circle. So that the person who lives here and here and here and here can all go to this market and get a cloth down coat if they want or get some bone meal or healing poultices or whatever it is that they need without having to walk all the way back here which saves them a lot of time and in turn makes your village more efficient make sure that you're utilizing markets well because you have all of these different kinds in colonial charter you can get edibles iron market cart stone market cart i mean it can be really useful see how i have these two wood choppers here well if i wanted to i could just put a wood market cart right here that way, all they have to do is go to that wood market cart. Instead of trying to chase down logs wherever they are, they just go right to that cart because the cart guy's job is to chase down the wood. So use markets to your advantage. It, it really allows you to expand over the map and create different unique areas as you're doing so. Tip number nine, slow it down a bit. So you have this, you know, ability to speed up time, which is obvious. But I find that playing on a lower speed is a much better way to play. There are things that are happening on 2 speed that you're just not privy to when you're at 10 speed. Things like dips in your different goods. Things like uh, buildings that are not getting enough. Like, see this just popped up. It's not getting enough to do what it needs to do. You need to play a little bit more slowly because when you're at speed 2, you're able to have much tighter control over what's going on. I know it's very tempting to speed up to, to 10, and I do play that way sometimes but it's it's much better to be at two now here's what i recommend for those of you who can't stand to wait is issue a few orders you know queue up some buildings at speed 10 and then change it to speed 10 for a season then go back down to two or one and issue some orders and then speed it back up again doing like that but be very careful you might not notice your food uh diminishing or your stone running out or some buildings not having enough goods to do what they need to do all of these things require your attention, so try to slow it down a little bit and you'll have more success, particularly in the early game. Which brings us to our last and final tip. It's uh, kind of similar to number nine, but that is just having patience. Now, I'm not the most patient person in the world, but Banished is not um, a shoot em in the face kind of tactical. It's, it's not. It's a slow, methodical game, and the slower you are, the more attention to detail you're able to have and the more mental energy you're able to put into the tiny little decisions you make, the better your village will flourish. And it's a very rewarding experience. And it does, you know, it releases the dopamine in our brains when we, when we get to do something that's rewarding like this and to build something from the ground up. Now, doing it well does require a lot of time. I believe I played uh, probably about 30 hours to get to this point, And it requires an insane amount of patience and time. And a lot of people have gone a lot further than me. But if you're coming at this game fresh and you're looking for like a general meta tip, patience, grasshopper, patience.